Uh, okay, we are... Now, let me send out the tweet to let the people know we are on the show, and we shall begin. Now, I know you don't um, go by Dr. Kate. But I'm going to call you Dr. Kate because it because cla- it classes up the joint, you know, and we need <laughs> we need a little class around here. I'll, I'll probably vacillate, frankly. Um, OK, we're ready. We're live. We're doing it. OK, excellent. Everybody, welcome uh, to uh, the show. I appreciate you being here as always. I, th- this one. This is one I'm insanely excited, uh, excited about. So this is uh, Dr. Kate Devlin uh, from Merry Old. Actually, Ireland is Northern Ireland is where you were were from. That's right. Originally, yeah. But I'm sitting in England. My kid. Well, listen, my kids, I was I I have I have the real book and then I have the audio book. And every time I'm listening to the audio book, my kids are like, would you stop saying that every time you say the word B-O-O-K? I have to repeat it in the way you say it. Cause I love the way you say book and cook. Go ahead. Just do it. Give it to us. Book, book, book. is book book. I love it. It sounds so much better. Um, and, and, and we're, you know, I'll, I'll just jump right into it. Cause there's a whole, you know, section of your book and, and also interviews you've done where you've talked about the gendering of artificial assistance. And it, it it's really, I mean, hell, we're just going to go over We're just going to start. Um, so, uh, you know, I should probably give you an intro. People are like, Jeffy, who is this lady? Okay. Dr. Kate uh, Devlin uh, is a PhD, computer science. Uh, you are a lecturer. I don't know if you're a full like professor, teacher, but you... Le- I, I think the equivalent is um, associate professor. Okay. At King's College in, uh, right. in London. Yeah. Um, you are an expert in artificial intelligence and... Uh, technology in general and your 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 focus is intimacy and technology would that be correct that's right it's a it's a it kind of a strange route i took to get there because i have a background initially in archaeology and actually my phd is in computer graphics so uh oh, okay. I, I did this very strange route but now i've ended up as an uh, ai and society and culture so okay yeah. okay and then you're also probably most well known for writing turned on which came out a couple of years back um that's right which i came to you by way of i think it was a sam harris interview with david levy who i know you you reference in this book as well saying is it david levy uh who wrote that's right yeah yeah, yeah. uh and and say and i haven't read his book yet but i hear from you that it's phenomenal although it's a little antiquated at this point um we, we, we disagree on a few things, but it's such a well-researched book that so it's, it's worth a look at. Right. That. And Turned On is mostly about, um, I mean, it deal, it's, it's interesting because it deals with sex toys going back thousands of years. And then it really takes, it, it's building on the idea of bringing us up to where sex robots are today and where they're going and, and things like that. So that's the crux of the book, correct? That's essentially it. Okay. And it's a great book it, it, as, a, as a, you know, I'm... I'm I was never good in science at, at school and stuff, but as a layperson, it reads like butter. It's a very enjoyable book to read. Thank um, you. You're, you're very welcome. If that was, unless it was written to be like a, you know, uh, an academic book, then it's you failed miserably. But as a, <laughs> as as just a layperson, I'm like, wow, this is this is understandable and exciting. Um, so, but one of the parts in the book was interesting to me. Well, it was all interesting, but when you talk about the gendering of Siri and Alexa and Cortana and whatnot. Um, and that was, the book was in 2018 and things have changed a little bit since then. And that was sort of what you were suggesting and predicting. And, and what I, what I found fascinating is I'm driving in my ex wife's car the other day and we're riding around and she does the maps thing. She's like, you know, or she asked Siri something and suddenly it's this British dude. And yeah. I, and I was like, Oh, I didn't, you know, it, it never occurred to me that she would have, you know, that, 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 that voice would have been done. I have a brother who's gay. He uses the male version, uh, as well of, of Siri. I use, I use the female version and, and I'm not trying to flirt with you, but she is, uh, the Irish one. Um, but that's cause I wanted her to sound like Becky Lynch and Amy Pond from Dr. Who. So that's the only reason. 
So when I tell her to set, Amazing. yeah, I tell her to set the alarm and she's like, dun. And I'm like, oh, it's Amy Pond talking to me. But anyway, um, so when you first wrote that and when you were, cause there's so much about sexism and misogyny and patriarchy that I think is very, obviously no one needs me to say it, but it's very valid in this subject. But when you wrote that, there was clearly, I think, a concern about that because the Silicon Valley guy, it's mostly men. Um. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still is. It hasn't really changed for years. Uh, I find it really very interesting, the whole route that computer science has taken, because, you know, initially women were the computers. They were called computers. They they would come in, they would do the maths. And if anyone's seen Hidden Figures, then you know about the, the story there. And there were so many different degrees of um, discrimination going on. So not only on a basis of sex, but also a race where uh, women were also being um, even segregated within that. Right. They were seen as, the women were seen as a subclass and then within that there were more subclasses. And so this this kind of hierarchy of power exists the whole way through, but um, we see it reflected in the technology that's made because we see that um, the people creating it don't often think about what is needed outside of their own needs and it just you know when i did this uh, i did a talk and, and I, I talk about it in the book where i was saying you know this is alexa it was made to be a, a, a given a woman's voice and the guy came up to me afterwards and said i worked in the company in the startup that was bought by amazon and um we never you know we just we didn't really pay attention to whether you know to this being a woman's voice and i thought well that's very telling in right. itself right that's right um and I read lots of lots of pieces about how oh well women's voices are perceived more whatever you know better perceived and, and, and not one of them stands up to scrutiny right. in terms of science. So I mean it's clear I guess in your mind and it makes sense to me that there is definitely that that initial decision is is coming out of just sort of systemic. Uh, Misogyny is the wrong word, but sort of just systemic sexism, I guess, that's just baked uh, it, in. It really is. You know. Yeah, it's, it is, it's something that, you know, I think if you point that out to people working in the industry, many of them will be horrified just that it hadn't occurred. I think, I, would I, think I, it's not an issue. I think most you know? <laughs> men are horrified anyway because, they, you know, it's like anything else. It's, it's good that all this stuff is bubbling up, but it's very hard to hear as it should be because it's, you know. It's tough. Absolutely. It's bad. But the thing is, though, does it does it hearten you, I guess, when you realize that ultimately capitalism is more is more powerful than sexism? Right. Because um, because Apple basically yeah. Apple basically someone made it clear to them that, hey, you'll get more customers, you'll make more money if you yeah. make options. And, and, and it wasn't like they resisted. They were just like, oh, we we didn't think about it. And so that- exactly, we're excluding half the market, potential market. Yeah, right. and, and in some ways, you know, as much as they do real against kind of a lot of the issues of capitalism, yes, in this case, doesn't it make business sense to be more inclusive? Absolutely. And if that's a lever we can use to get in and change things, great. Right. Because I, I mean, I, I don't, I, 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 I got into all this by way of video games, which really isn't Silicon Valley so much as it's the whole West coast for the most part, you know, right. and everywhere else too, these days, but you know, yeah, they're, they're definitely, I never got the sense when we would do things. Cause we would, we get, we still get hit today in video games about, you know, sexism and inclusion and things like that. And th- there's never a conscious, which is make, which is what makes it obviously insidious, but there's never a conscious, Hey, let's sit down and, and, and be offensive and be exclusive. But the fact that they changed, I think is, is a good thing. And I, I, I liked seeing that. Um, and I love the fact now that it's just a knee jerk for my brother to put on a dude and for my ex to put on a dude. And it's like, why wouldn't I, but now, which leads to the next question though, which is like, you know, there, there's, I, I don't want to kind of, you know, spoil the book, but the, the, where the book is really going, fuck it, we'll spoil it. Where the book is really going, I think is what you're saying is, yeah, you're having to deal with sex robots and, and, and tech and sex now by way of almost like f- form leading function. But ultimately, That's what right. it sounds like you want to see is you're like, look, I got no problem with sex robots, but it's it's kind of 
it's almost like you're so ahead of the curve that you sound crazy, but you're not. Um, well, because it's, it, I'm going to, you know, you talk about the ultimate sex robot would not be a woman or a man. The ultimate sex robot would be an appliance that it's got tentacles and it can have a penis and a vagina and it can have a blend of those things that can be made out of velvet. And, you know, it's ultimately, it's like, it's a pleasure, uh, uh, appliance. Why would you tie it to all of these, you know, sorts of, of, of limiting things, correct? Yes. And there's some different strands to that because for some people they want, um, an artificial partner, right? They want more than, than just this kind of, as you call it, a sex appliance, right? So they want something that is representative of something more than that. Um, for others, they might be looking for uh, something that is purely about pleasure and doesn't matter what shape it takes. And, and so I did a lot of work in to, you know, talking to people and learning about, you know, especially the sex doll community, um, people, and, and I'm, don't even, the phrase sex doll is just for, for our own reference because the people who own these dolls prefer not to use the term sex doll. Um, but this idea of um, what does that mean to people to, to have something like that, which is the closest parallel we have to sex robots. And for many people, it boils down to companionship and the companionship takes the form of something that is human-like. But for others, it is about um, the beauty of the objects. So for other people, it's about, a, it, some people it's about a fetish. So there are many reasons why people might want to interact with these, these things if we did eventually get to a world where a sex robot was commonplace. And it doesn't necessarily need to look human. But do you, right. So what's interesting to me about that is that, and, and maybe you're right, it depends on why you are utilizing this tool. But you also talk about the uh, pepper, the robot pepper, which is yeah. obviously not a sex robot, but it is a very, <laughs> no, I mean, I guess it could be, you know, no, because in its terms I, and conditions, it strictly yeah. says, do not have sex with this robot. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And if you go, I, I, I watched videos of pepper. I, I had seen it. I didn't know that was who it was, but pepper is a very cute, uh, little robot with a cute little voice and big eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's made for, I guess, to greet you when you come into like a department store yeah, or a hotel it's like a service. And, Right. Uh, shop service robot. But one of the things that you write about is 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 sort of figuring out the anthropomorphic elements that are appealing, like big eyes and things like that. And and, and in that, it, it made me wonder, it's like, and maybe it's just me, but I'm like, yeah, if I were to have a sex doll like or a sex robot, I'm not really interested in sex dolls, but I would love a sex robot if, you know, the far flung, flung future. Um, I wouldn't want it to be... I wouldn't want it to look like a vacuum cleaner. You know, I'd want it to feel like I'm having this, you know, relationship with, but yeah. I, I, and I get that everyone's different, but do you think, especially given that, and this goes back to like Siri with my brother and my ex being the male version, do you think that ultimately, yeah, the most interesting sexual experience you can have is with the appliance, but people aren't really necessarily even looking for that so much as they're looking for, sort of their version of the perfect relationship, which I includes. Definitely think, yeah, I definitely think there's an element of that, of looking for the perfect relationship in a lot of things. And and those stories go way back. They go back. Yes, right fascinating. And, and, you know, this this idea that we can create something that will complete us, that will, you know, be there for us unjudgmentally and uncritically. And we see it down the, down the years in, in all our sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, we see it in the sci-fi films that we watch. And there are so many examples of that where um, you will have the most beautiful creature that has been created in this beautiful sex robot one, the fembot, uh, who tends to meet either a really sticky end, you know, it tends to be she'll either um, rise up and kill everyone or she'll right. be a terrible disaster. Right. So yeah, <laughs> we are primed to expect certain things from our technology. We're primed to expect that robots will look human, even though that most of the robots we have in the world today don't look human at all. But, um, but that that's not by choice necessarily, right? I mean, that's by just limitations, correct? It, it is often by limitations, but often because that form, it, it would not be suited to, to being a human form practically so robot vacuum cleaners or right. robot milking machines none of these need to be in a human form robot agriculture robots bomb disposal robots they meet a certain function and then you see robots um being created by companies like boston dynamics who make these 
um, right. humanoid ones or you know the dog spot that yep. uh, looks like some kind of weird murder dog um and you think you know this is the one where the, the, the people who are building spot will, will kick the dog or poke it with a broom. Yes. Uh, and people get really like panicked. They go, yeah. oh my God, hurting the robot. And you think that's the power of anthropomorphizing. Right. Or giving those significant, giving that significance to the robot. Do you think that, it, I mean, uh, so there's so, there's so much about this subject that's so rich in terms of sort of how we respond to the world and how we respond to each other. Like the, the shaming, for example, like I, I, I right now, most of the stuff I do on the internet is based on video games, but for a long time, I would just do stories I found fascinating regardless. And, and, and inevitably we would be using the sun, uh, from, from the UK because they just, it's the craziest thing in the world. And, and I, <laughs> and, and, and I come from the country that has the national Enquirer back, you know, uh, and, and I'm still saying the sun has it beat, but, but they would write about sex robots consistently and they still, oh, yeah. and they still do. But sometimes we would read about things and we would do stories about things like, you know, a guy in Japan, who married his sex robe or not sex ro uh, his doll or sex doll or whatever uh or the 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 thing i think it's called glass box or whatever in japan oh, yeah, right now yeah, yeah. that has the virtual anime assistant that comes home and it's like how was your day and and, and on one hand there's such a knee jerk to shame those people and to say that's bad that's wrong look at that loser but when you really think about it and I hear you talk about a lot of these people and there's such a kindness and there's such an understanding. I, I wonder about like what your take is on sort of why we feel the need to be so othering of these types of folks when they're not harming anyone and they're clearly getting something out of it. Is it more like when you watch like a, 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 a raucous talk show and it's like, haha, I feel better about myself because I'm not that loser or what, what do you think that's about? I think there is an element of that. There's also, it's, yeah, it's a very um, clickbait type of thing. So, you know, the, the papers know they will get hits when they right. do these kind of stories and sex cells and um, weird futuristic robot -y things, that's appealing. So they write these stories and never bother to fact check them. So I see story after story saying, you know, sex robots are here and they're right. gonna take over the world. And you have to reply, they, they phone me for a quote. And I say, okay, they're not here. Um, right. They're prototypes, and you know they can't even stand up on their own. And right. this is really limited. Um, and then they, they, they probably don't use you. They're like, ah, oh, you're no, bored. No, yeah. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> right. Just, and then they say, but when will they be here? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I possibly never. <laughs> so. Right. Well, re I mean, so I mean, do you do you like? Okay, I can tell you for me and I don't think either one of us will be alive for it. Maybe we will, but probably not. We, we might be alive for the, the digital version, esh. But um, I, look, if you, if you gave me a Gigolo Jane from AI, I would go awesome, right? I mean, yeah. you know, and I, I saw it might have been on a, uh, an interview on YouTube with Katie Couric, but it was like 25% of men who were proposed this idea of, of sort of the ideal version of a sex robot like you see in the movies would say, yeah, I'm, I'm down mm -hmm. for that. And even if you read the comments and the, now again, people who search up videos on sex robots, they're probably predisposed to, to be a fan, I assume. <laughs> but the comments were all like, you know, why would I not want this? Why would I, you know, I, yeah. I, I wonder about, you know, do you think it's inevitable? Like, do you think, you know, maybe it's 500 years away, but it's, why would we not end up here? Um, I mean, I can't really see a reason why we wouldn't. Um, and, I, and I don't particularly, see, I don't see harm in it, which is, a, you know, a whole other strand of that. Um, I think it's unrealistic right now from a very practical perspective. Sure. Um, it's, it's just too difficult to make human-like uh, robots. But I agree with you about the digital version. So we're seeing increasingly sophisticated chatbots um, with GPT-3, um, so the natural language processing has reached a stage where you can have relatively okay conversations, generate text that seems as if it's been written by a human. Right. And it falls over, sure. but it's getting better. And so we're starting to see 
um, chatbots that you, that we'll be able to have more companion like relationships with. They won't they won't understand us, but does that matter? They'll never understand because, us, probably, right? Right, exactly. Right. So if they give the semblance of understanding us and engagement, that's usually enough for us. We can form a relationship with machines that we are perfectly aware will not understand us, and we do it all the time. I have a fondness for my robot vacuum cleaner. He's mm -hmm. called Babbage. He's really cool. Right. I sometimes you know pick him up and go, well done. And put him back in his home. Do you um, really? So I really do. I, where I know, is I don't where pet. is he? Where's Babbage. He's just right here. He's Babbage. just right here beside me. Is he voice Babbage. activated? Uh, he's not. Well, no, I haven't set that. Hang on. This is, this is Babbage. Well, hello, good sir Babbage. <laughs> good to see you, buddy. I read. So, yeah. I read the other day that the new ones can recognize dog poop, and they'll go around it. I'm not even joking with you. About time. That's yeah. really useful. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. yeah so sorry. So you. Uh, but we, we do this all the time. We yeah. build. You know, I personally wear a bag, which is just a piece of plastic that cleans my floors. Not very efficiently either. Right. Um. But you know, it's that kind of cuteness of tech, and we think, oh, that's sweet, and we buy into it all the time. And and so yes, I mean, companies like Google are are building more and more elements of personality into their voice assistants. And those voice assistants can't chat with us. They're essentially no, no. just search engines that are verbalizing things. Yeah. But they're starting to put these personality tweaks in. Well, I liked your example in the book where you were like, you can say to Siri, and I always have to be careful because I, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but Set you, everyone's off. <laughs> right, yeah. But, but, but you can say to Siri like, hey Siri, what's the weather like in San Diego? But all you really have, to, oh shit. She heard it. She heard it because I said, hey, but um, uh, but all you really have to say is like you said, is like, there you go. She's talking. OK, so. OK, I don't care. All you really have to say, though, is, you know, H Siri. And then you say uh, weather, mm -hmm. weather, San Diego. It's like I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know what your era of life is but when i was a kid the games were like text adventures and yes. you could you couldn't say open up the mailbox and put the letter in but you would yeah. say like go mailbox mail letter yeah, yeah go mailbox and it's like you know and, and, and it you know it felt very artificial but that's kind of north, north north that's right north. but that's kind of what these are right that's that's basically the level for the most yeah. part you know but so when okay so the idea, though, like you're talking about Google and, and whatnot, I mean, would you agree that we will get to there's so much unless this changes and it might by the time the technology catches up. But there's so much shame, at least in America, associated with sex and sexuality and whatnot, that it's hard to imagine that a company like Apple or Google mm. is ever going to come out with their version of Gigolo Joe and Gigolo Jane. It's like you're Tim Cook, like one more thing, and here come you know kind of walks <laughs> out. Um, but but that said though, I imagine the way we'll get there because you're even saying that you know on these sex robots at these companies like Real Doll and whatnot, that's always going to be a niche basically. Mm -hmm. But I imagine the way we really will get there is over time, Apple, Google, whoever the new you know Musk, whatever, will release practical robots for the home that will eventually, whether it's open source or whether it's just apps you can download, that will allow a sexual and an intimacy component. I mean, isn't isn't that the way we'll probably arrive here versus a defined sex robot? Yeah, I think so. I think it's possible. I definitely think the, the digital first route is, is the main way where it becomes more and more acceptable to have conversational agents, chatbots that, uh, that enable that kind of talk and that you can build a kind of a rapport with and a closeness with. So almost like the film Her. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, where you form this relationship with your with your operating system, for example. And I think that's much more realistic than, yeah, the big companies coming right. out with something. But then, I mean, that's been, it, this is really difficult. I think um, when it comes to anything around sex, the corporations are going to avoid it. Um, so, you know, we, we we're only now seeing sex toys becoming something that can be talked about a bit more openly and even then not so much and right. consumer electronics show last year there was a huge fuss over the fact that you know uh, a smart vibrator had won a prize but then they banned it from the show and you mm. think really is that the way we're going at the stage um yet they were happy to have the prototype sex robot on stage so it's again it's a gendered aspect right. but um I think there is that aspect and there is this wave of kind of new puritanism, puritanism that comes through. Right. Um, that is, 
you know, there are big issues there, definitely. Well, when you take the when you take that and then you merge it with this this weird, in my opinion, irrational fear of technology. It, it, <laughs> it's it's the ultimate. <laughs> right. It's it, it and I, I wanted to ask you about that because I mean I remember being a kid of the late seventies and eighties where you know, the first ATM came to Alabama and it was like, holy cow, the, you know, Oz has come to town. What is the snake oil salesman? You know, but I thought it was the coolest thing, but my parents took a couple of years before they were comfortable with it. Yeah. But don't, I, to me, I go, we've lived enough life now, both directly and through anecdotes and, and history to go, you know, we know our knee jerk is to be afraid of this tech, mm. but more often than not, it really, we shouldn't be, but it seems like we can never get out of that pattern of like, oh, you know, why do you think we're so averse to just going, hey, this is cool. Let's fucking play with it. I mean, why does oh, it have to be is, so? This is a, such a long standing thing. Yeah. Humans have been doing this for hundreds of years, like getting worried about tech all the time. I mean, isn't there a story sort of Socrates being afraid of writing things down because it would ruin memory? And you know, it goes right through to, you know, the printing press. Well, that's just going to destroy everything. Or newspapers, you right. know, no one's ever going to function in society again. And TV, oh, that'll kill the But family, isn't there you know? a point, though, where we go, oh, we do this. No. Let's stop doing this. It's, we, you'd think we'd learn each time. We right. never seem to. Um, I, I would say that the fear there is not a fear of the technology. It's a fear of us losing control. It's a fear of the loss of agency. We're scared of being replaced. We're scared of personal relationships being replaced, which is why the fear around, around sex is so huge. Because, you know, it's one thing if, you know, your, your, I don't know, your a secretary gets replaced by a voice assistant. It's a whole other thing if your partner gets replaced by a, a digital version. You know, well, okay, like okay, but I got to ask you that too. So look, that fear that I see come up all the time around this topic, which is, you know, uh, in, in fact, there's a, there's a, Katie Couric's asking this guy at, I think it's the one in Santa Cruz that you were at. Um, it's not Real Doll, but one, one of the ones. Uh, it's the one that has Harmony. Um, yeah, that's real doll. Yeah, real so doll. The best creation. Yeah, okay, yeah. so she's basically asking the CEO. It's like, well, is this going to replace relationships? And he's like, no, no, it's an it's a it's an ad or it's an alternative or whatever. And in my mind, I'm going, well, so what, right? And, and and I don't mean that like relationships are bad. I'm not like I don't I don't know what the word is. I don't know if there is a word. I'm not like anti relationship. I think that's a wonderful thing. But mm. if you're saying you can create like you can you can you know i don't know if you play video games but if you go into like an npc or if you go into a character creator and it's like i'm going to create my ultimate partner and she's going to be or he's going to be into these things and he's going to be uh into this and she's going to like this and it's almost like going on a dating app and saying this is what yeah. i like and 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 everything from the specific or, or the the high level of like what you're into both intellectually and sexually and whatever to just some of the craziest stuff that's like you know I, I hate to be i don't hate to be vulgar it's not vulgar but you know some people you know get into it but um fuck it i'll tell you the story here's here's the deal i remember let, let's just say that oral sex when you're a man takes a little it's an acquired taste to get used to eating out a woman okay and the first time i did it in college i was kind of like I don't know if she had, I told my friends, like, does she have a yeast infection? They're like, no, dude, that's, that's what it takes. I'm like, and it took me, and it took me a couple of months to go, oh, I get it. You know, but ultimately all of these things that make us human. And I assume on the same way, if it's a, a, a someone who does, you know, blow jobs and it's like, oh dude, I don't want to fucking swallow that shit. You know, uh, you know, you can make it taste like Mountain Dew. You can, I mean, you could do all kinds of things to, to, to make the perfect version yeah. of the experience why is that something that we are oh that's a horrible thing wouldn't we want to do that this is really it really interests me um what, what my I, sexual history in college really that's interesting. also really interesting. fair me. enough yeah but more so yeah that's gonna be in your <laughs> next so book the, the, yeah <laughs> more so the um this yes this idea that there has to be that you have to stick with the prescribed social relationship thing yes and i think that in in, in many ways um i uh, i don't i don't believe that i think that if someone's very happy with whatever setup they want and they're not harming anyone else yeah go for it right absolutely go for it 
but I've been contacted so many people that I have sat on panels with, I've been in debates with, and they have told me that the only acceptable relationship is a relationship with another human. Yeah. But then they, they you know, and to them, it's, it's a very clear picture in their mind that, that this should, this is some kind of nature's way. I don't know. And it's not always religious inspired. Often it is. Um, but, you know, I, why? And they say things like, oh, but that, that means they, they might never have a relationship with a real person. And I'm thinking, and? Right. Why, why is that, you know? Is that necessarily a bad thing? Maybe they prefer this, you know. If they if they've been given the options of these things and they've picked the robot, and what you know, who am I to judge that? I don't understand why people are so defensive about this idea. And as for this, you know, this thing of of going well, you know, they can't ever love you back. People fall in love with other humans all the time who don't even know they exist. Taylor Swift. <laughs> that, I I don't think did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, why? Okay, you're w much more experienced and versed and, and intelligent about this. I can't even hazard a guess. Why? What is that? Why, why is that so? Uh, uh, such a preoccupation for people. I don't know, and I th I think that there's something that's just being socialized over the years. That there's a, there's a big cultural baggage there um, that has said you know don't you, you must stick to the the very prescribed way of doing things, that there is a right way of doing things. And it's why we see a lot of antipathy towards uh, alternative forms of lifestyles, for example. Right. That you're not behaving yourself in line with the way that society expects it. Right. And I think people are very scared of that because it's outside their comfort zone. I, I don't know if it's just my kids or it's a generational thing in general. I, I have been very excited to see the new generation be very open to... Yeah. Not, e not even different genders, just obliterating the concept of gender entirely. Yeah. You know, in, in all those sorts of things, they really seem so much more accepting, which maybe it is a good sign that we're just evolving out of it very slowly. But do you feel the same way about people who complain about, oh, you're always on your cell phone? <laughs> so that doesn't bother me. It, no, <laughs> so well, no, no, it does. Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's like my, my take is, if that's more interesting than yeah. <laughs> the person you're sitting at dinner with, maybe the real problem is not your obsession with your phone. Maybe the real problem or not even the problem, but it's like the phone offers a better time than you. Sorry. Maybe. I mean, if, I, if I'm in a, a situation where there's two people and one of them's on their phone, I would be, I would be quite annoyed because I'm going to have a conversation with them. As but would I, I you know, but yeah. But if, if people want to, you know, I, I've, you know, I've had people say it before, like, oh, why look at you all sitting around, you know, I, I sit with my daughter uh, and my partner and we'll, we'll sit and look at our phones. And I'm sure people are judging the hell out of us because we're, but we're usually we're reading things. Right. But if we sit with a book, would people judge us as much if we were sitting with books? No, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm done with people. I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like them. 80% of Let's them. Let's replace do. them all with robots. I would anyway. love to. We're doing that anyway. You, you <laughs> okay. talked about AI and some of your stuff, the movie AI from Spielberg. This totally tangent. We're going to get back on the main topic, but I have to ask you: at the end of that movie, those are robots, right? Those yeah. are not aliens. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think so. Okay. So ultimately, yeah. I mean, we're I'm we're dying to not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're gonna we're going there anyway. I mean, we're gonna we are gonna all be replaced with robots or or some kind of hybrid or something right i mean i think we're gonna i think we, you know we we are increasingly this technology is becoming more and more um ingrained into our lives we don't even notice it a lot of the time i yes i did you was it in your book or a, an interview where you said within the first hour of your day yeah you, you, that's right yeah so yeah. in the book yeah so within the first hour of my day i've interacted with so many different forms of ai and forms of technology just from checking a tree in time to you know dropping my kid at school there are so many aspects that are digitally controlled and i'm cool with that because you know what my life works better for it they yeah. are tools that work and i don't have a problem with it and i think that we as humans adapt and there are times when that technology is damaging and those are the times we should be worried about not the general thing but the times when the technology is causing harm when there's bias that's affecting people when people are being discriminated against those are the times we should be calling out but saying, oh, I can't, I can't use technology because it's bad. I mean, that's, that's, that's such a pile of bullshit. I mean, right. It really is. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I want to talk about the Uncanny Valley a little bit because um, what's interesting to me is, is that – how, how do I phrase it without sounding like a total weirdo? But fuck it, I don't care. Um, but it's like 
you do have these people like if you go onto the real doll website which i had not gone on to and it was like i tweeted yesterday it was like ordering a pizza it was it was like oh what toppings would you like it's like holy mm -hmm. cow right but you go on there and you can fashion whatever you want and included on there are um like anime style ladies yeah. that don't obviously they look like an anime come to life they don't look like a real you know person um and the question becomes like i know there are people according you know the, i learned this from your book that are like and i forget the terms but there are people that are genuinely attracted to the fact that it is a an object yeah. like you mentioned someone was attracted to the eiffel tower or whatever um, yeah yeah so digisexuals and techno fetishists and things like that yeah. right and yeah. then there are people who are looking for a real partner yeah. and so they want it as real as possible um have you found that you know can you categorize the types of people that are a or b like is it like the people who tend to be into um an object versus a real uh simulation tend to be mentally healthier or more damaged or i mean is there any kind of link there no, i mean i don't know there haven't i mean i, I don't think there have been those kind of psychological evaluations of people to right. determine that and and honestly i think i, I actually think perhaps the fetishist is a smaller group perhaps um but you know i don't know for sure um the people who for example people who buy dolls um there's you know there's this tendency of the media to judge and have this knee-jerk reaction that says well they all must be lonely weirdos and that you know that is not true and i think that's very unfair um these are people who oh and, and i and i stand by this people that it's, it's like a it's like a hobby in many ways it's just that their hobby is very different from maybe your hobby right um, right there's something there that you know they they are it's a community of people uh, i'm not you know i'm not going to speak for them i'm not a member of that community but you know i know people who are and uh, you know it's just it's just people that have an interest that differs from one of my interests i genuinely don't see um that is very different and also particularly you know okay it tends to be men um it's very hard to find women uh, who admit to being doll owners although um, they, 50 percent of women are buying the male dolls right well apparently i uh, yeah this is what is that's what they valid. say okay that's what they say i'm not sure um but yeah if we take that at face value then yeah but it's very hard to find one to talk to um but you know, you tend to have to have quite a bit of money to be able to buy these. They're they're expensive, so it tends to be people who are employed, um, right. uh, people who may um, may or may not be in relationships. Some people are, um, and they may be in heterosexual relationships, and their partners are perfectly aware and happy with the fact that they have a doll, or it's people who live with the dolls as if they are a partner. Right. Um, it's people who collect them not because they are you know not for the purpose the more main motivation of sex but right. because they are interested them in them as a, as an object in their own right and these are really beautifully crafted objects and when i, I went yep. to see them yeah i was really shocked because i did expect to be slightly horrified right. <laughs> and i wasn't i just thought they you know I, well i was it was a really strange feeling because i was looking at these very beautifully crafted pieces of work pieces of art almost um and that surprised me because to me, it's a reduction of the female form into a very stereotypical shape. But then so is a lot of art. So. Sure. <laughs> well, what about that 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 claim that it is uh, and there, there was a woman, I think her name was Patricia, Dr. Patricia, no, Dr. K Kathleen Richardson or something. Kathleen Richardson, yeah, yeah. And you did a you did. A, I don't know what it was. I'd say it was a debate discussion interview. She she was, uh, you know, in my opinion, she was out of her goddamn mind. But that said, um, let me just let the audience know. So she doesn't, she has a problem calling them sex bots. Uh, mm. she wants to call them porn bots, child abuse, porn bots, porn AI. They're versions of rape, abuse, torture, murder, uh, deception, cutting, bruising, strangling, choking. I, I mean, I think this is one of those cases I could be wrong, but this seems like one of those cases where the speaker is revealing more about their own self and sort of their views of the world than actually educated takes on things. But that, but who knows? I, I'm not, I, it's just, that was my read. And I thought your ability to not reach through the screen and throttle her was, was impressive. Um, but she's coming at it. And I do think you would agree that there is a sexist aspect to the way oh, yeah. 
these things are being done. Um, but the question becomes, is that like, okay, I mean, it gets so deep, I think, because on one hand, I was going to say, if you're going to make a sex robot or if I'm going to go to the Real Doll website and I'm going to go through and order my pizza, um, I'm going to pick out the ideal version of what I think an ideal woman looks like and what she yeah. acts like and all that. Um, I understand in real world, those expectations of a real person are not only unrealistic, but they're damaging and they're problematic. But this is fantasy. This is, yeah, you know, um, but this lady is is like saying it. it, it, it I, I think is her concern that it carries over into real life. That's the main gist of it. I mean, she's yeah, she's very opposed to many aspects of of of, of things that, that 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 yeah that involve sex. And one of her issues is that this will spill into the real world, um, and that she she feels that there is a potential that if people did harm to these robots and treated them badly, then they would treat humans badly. Now, I was, well, first of all, there, there aren't any robots but as such, but there are dolls. And I, I talked to people about this and um, the majority of people I met, in fact, everyone I met and talked to about, about their dolls was incredibly respectful and cherishing of the dolls because now, not just because these are expensive. I was going to say they're ten thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but because that that for them it's something they are things to be cherished. Now, there's a whole other thing there about objectification. Yeah, fine. But the thing is, the that there was not there are no elements of violence. Now, they did say a couple of people said you will occasionally hear things from other members of the group that where you know when people do enact violence or are really uh, like talk crudely or abusively. And it's kind of frowned upon. So there's almost almost like a self-policing in this. Um, so as, I guess it's, as, you know, it's the same as the human population. By and large, people tend to be nice. And then you get occasional assholes. And I think this is clearly the same in a subgroup of people. But um, it, 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 oh, keep going, sorry. Yeah, no, I, so I was just going to say, you know, so, but she, so this, this idea that, that there's an automatic thing where if you buy a doll and she equates it to kind of buying a woman yeah. and saying this is a control thing and and you know I don't I don't see it like that I see it much more like what you're saying which is I'm choosing to buy into a fantasy I'm choosing to go along with a fantasy setup and the people are not delusional here there's no delusion about you know thinking any of these dolls are real everyone's perfectly aware that these are these are dolls right but they're putting stories into them the same way that we might, you know, identify with characters in a book or in a film. Right. So I, I don't see that that is an issue at all. Well, and, and should there actually be a line though? Cause like it, it, another part of your book you talk about, I forget the, 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 the percentage, but it was, it was high enough to be meaningful, which is both, you know, there, there, there's a, a meaningful percentage of women that have rape fantasies. There's a mm -hmm. meaningful percentage of men who fantasize, I guess some fantasize about being raped, but the larger percentage fantasize about being the aggressor. And those are pure fantasy, and that does spill over into role play when you're with yeah. your human partner. Yeah. So I don't even know why, why would it be frowned upon if that spills into sex robot? I mean, it's, it's I, like- I agree with that. And this is, this is it's, so what I've discovered in the past few years about doing research into things around sex is it's incredibly difficult to get this kind of information because Men tend to over-exaggerate. Women tend to under-report when it comes to talking about sex. Yeah. Just this is, you know, just the way society has the place we are right now. Right. And so when it came, the, the, a lot of the work done on fantasy was done maybe twenty years ago, maybe before that, and it's really difficult to kind of get a really good, um, good grasp of that. But essentially, yes, these, these, this kind of sex forms fantasies that people may or may not you know act out with partners rarely rarely does it proportion we, we see no proportional representation of that in the real world no you so, equated it to like video game violence you're right. like no one oh, yeah so you know if if video game violence was as endemic as people worry about we'd be seeing a massive spike That's it's right. the same, you know it's exactly that and we don't see that and in fact the studies okay the thousands of studies they tend to not really agree on anything but the it, it's kind of edging that that actually there may, there may even be benefits yeah. to this. Right. It, it allows people to express. It's global warming um, is real. The vaccines work, and there's no 
correlation between game violence right. and right those three we know those are the three truths that's exactly know. right that's right <laughs> and uh, there are no sex robots yet <laughs> th- yet yet that's right um except digitally but um sort of whatever um okay so what about um i mean the, the and we have uh, ricardo thank you for the super chat i'll get to all the super chats in, in a little bit but this one it comes up probably every time someone talks to you because it's kind of the edge case but it's also fascinating which is pedophilia um, and, and the idea of like yeah. Ricardo's asking, I think it was Ricardo who says, what about, you know, selling child versions of these dolls yeah. that pedophiles can do whatever they do with. And obviously I don't think there, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a study, but I assume if there was a study that said, look, if you give a pedophile a doll, the chances of that person acting on their horrible instinct goes down 80%. I mean, I wonder would people have a problem with it? Oh, but I don't think yeah. we know, right? We have no idea. We don't know. And there's no one's gonna take the risk of running that study. It's Why? never gonna get through ethical clearance, right? Because uh, because you just, to, to be, you know, there's just really hard to do. And they, there are, so, and, and even to say, maybe that's the case, you'll, you'll, you'll just get people going, we can't ever even do that. So my, I'm he- hedging things here and going this, mirrors uh, a relationship that would not be acceptable in real life and therefore we shouldn't let it happen uh we don't know the effect it will have and unlike when you've got consenting adults involved that's a very different scenario right, right so right, that's, right. that's my, my my line on that but interestingly um well i'm not saying with i'm saying with it's with a robot or a doll yeah yeah, uh, yeah okay yeah but yeah no i'm saying that because yeah so because I, that could it, lead to someone in the real world doing something with a real person I'm, I'm yeah and i'm i'm not you know i don't necessarily know that it would but that's the risk that's the line for me of that we don't want to risk that got it um and so there was a study at the university of montreal looking at sex offenders and using virtual reality to test whether or not sex offenders oh. post rehabilitation were aroused in virtual settings and you know, they, they find that they were able to to tell that, you know, like use virtual reality as a, as a tool for evaluating this kind of thing. Um, but they were asked actually about, could you do this with, with sort of childlike sex dolls? And they said, we're not even gonna go there. This is not, this is definitely not even gonna be a study. But the, the study um, that they did in VR, was it with like that's with, pedophiles that was, I think, or? I don't think so. I think it was, I, I'm not sure. Um, actually it might've been, I okay. can't remember. I'll have to look it up. But I think that this is an area where people get really, really concerned. Now we know that, so there's, there's, just to start off, there are no childlike sex robots that we know of. Right. Uh, robots that are being developed are usually fe- adult and female. There are have, those little mini dolls though you talked there about. There are mini dolls, but they are they have the proportions of, of yeah. Yeah, but those those are creepy, man. I mean, those there look are, like, yeah. yeah. There are, however, there are childlike dolls that are out there. Um, and the UK had uh, did a, like a, a sting and they arrested a bunch of people because of this. They were importing the dolls. And under a very archaic UK law about obscenity, um, they then were able to go and search the computers of the people who'd ordered the dolls and find oh. um, images of child sexual abuse. So we know that there is uh, a link between that and would they go on to offend in real life? We don't necessarily know. Right. Now the US completely like went all out on this and they introduced the Creeper Act, um, which was a law prohibiting the development of childlike sex robots. Like we haven't even got to the stage of the adult ones, but they went ahead and said, no way can you do the child ones. Right, right, Fine. right. Okay, okay, cover your bases. <laughs> so, right. um, so I think this is a, it's a very emotive area. It's, a, it's, you know, it's not something that we have evidence for. It's not something that we're likely ever to be able to study. Um, and there are the, the two opinions, the people who think, well, it might be an outlet, a way of, of kind of mitigating the urge to offend. And there are other people, uh, and I've talked to some psychologists who work in, in clinical settings with sex offenders, and they've said, do not let this happen. This could escalate issues. This will lead to further abuse. So it's really tricky. And I think we have to just basically not go there because we, we, we cannot get that evidence. Right. I mean, I, I assume ultimately when this, I mean, we're talking far flung future. I don't know what that means, if that's 500 years or 100 years, but maybe more. But I'm assuming there will come a day where you will have this robot and you can wake up, I mean, and say, I want it to have this personality today. Mm. And then the next day, it's like, I want it to be a totally different person. 
Um, and you, I mean, yeah. even to the point that you've got people selling, you've got celebrities going, okay, I'll sell my AI likeness to, you know, real doll. Uh, what it's, it would be Google well, or whatever. Um, we're almost nearly there with that. So, I mean, first the, the Roxy true companion, which was, um, right. if you Google sex robots, you often see adverts for Roxy. Roxy doesn't seem to really exist. The right. guy who makes her has never actually shown us a working model since about 2010 prototype. Um, but Roxy makes the papers every now and again because apparently she had different modes and there was Wild Wendy and Mature whoever and you know this thing and um, right. she had like a, a, a I can't even remember a frigid fire so there was this kind of idea that you would be able to choose a personality and then they would refuse sex so you're kind of essentially raping this robot and right. it was sort of like a big thing in the papers anyway that robot does not exist right <laughs> but of course the other thing I was gonna say, yeah. Um, so the other thing, oh yeah, no, I forgot where I was going to go with that. Well, far, uh, far future. Are we that you can wake up and change his personality, or get a uh, get a celebrity and say, you know, that was it, the celebrity thing. Yeah. So uh, I mean, real doll with their dolls already life. The, we have porn performers who license their image to be made into dolls. Uh, so that already happens. So yes, that is an avenue that could could happen. Yeah. Do you think that someone like yourself, when you hear lay people talking about? far-flung future and, and and i'm thinking it is going to be whether it's like blade runner 2048 or seven whatever it was or uh the, you know ai is is that is that just kind of like eh or do you think no that's where we're going to end up in a couple hundred years maybe in a couple of hundred years not in my lifetime sure. um yeah i think that we'll be doing well if we get good conversations that last <laughs> right, right 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 in the next sort of 50 years. I think AI, um, I hate doing forecasts on AI because you know, it's always another 20 years, another 20 years. Oh, just yeah. another 20 years. Well, you talk uh, about think, this whiteout, right? Isn't that what you called it? The, uh, the AI, winter, winter. AI winter, right? Yeah. And that's so like, happened go ahead. From the very start. So in, in when the um, Dartmouth convention, Dartmouth workshop, excuse me one second, I've got um, sure. a phone call coming through. Mick, can you answer that for me, please? Can you answer that for me, please? Sorry about this. Yeah. Don't know who's phoning. It's a mystery, but I've tried three times. Put him on. Let me talk to him. <laughs> so. No? All right. Yeah. So um, when the, the, the Dartmouth conference happened yes. in, in the mid-50s, this was kind of the the start of AI, and it was going to be a big thing. And these guys said, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to solve speech recognition in the next 10 years. We're going to have a chess playing AI in the next 10 years. And of course, 10 years passed. And no it didn't happen and so it, it it tailed off and and funding dried up because they suddenly realized the challenges of ai were too huge they kind of peaked you know it kind of went up again picked up in the 80s and then off again because you know every time we think we've made a step forward something happens and kind of comes along because well, it's a bit more complicated than that and i think right now with ai we're at this wonderful stage of, of deep learning where amazing things are happening yeah but there are going to be limitations where we kind of reach um, a, a place where we have to go, okay, we've gone as far as we can with this. And until things catch up, either the hardware or, you know, the ability of our, our research, then you're always going to get these AI winters. So with robotics, you know, this, this aim to create a very human-like one. Like, so Elon, Elon has said that we will have this um, oh, right. I saw that robot. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Elon, don't promise these things. Um, <laughs> you know, this is, and, and, and so, you know, of course, I said on Twitter, oh, that's so not going to happen, says right. every roboticist ever. And suddenly I get, you know, a hundred Elon fanboys going, oh my God, I can't believe you dissed Elon. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of a double edged sword, though, because he does get a lot of people excited about stuff that they wouldn't. He does. But at the same yeah. time, I mean, you know, look, everything needs a little, a little flash, right? So I got to give him props that he's providing a show which is kind of, he knows how to wrap the medicine for your, you know, when you give your pet a, a, a pill, you got to wrap it in some kind of bread That's or something. True. But he I, the bacon on it. right. But I hear you though. I mean, yeah, it's unfortunate, <laughs> especially that if you remember that uh, intro of the robot, it, it was like somebody in a costume coming out and dancing. Well, I'm yeah, like, what, the, what yeah. is this? It's not even a real robot. That's somebody in a, that's a cosplayer. But, yeah. um, but anyway, yeah, sorry. So yeah, it, it's, it's um, the AI is, is obviously not there. And you're saying we might be going back into kind of an AI. Yeah, there are thoughts that we're gonna, we've hit kind of the limits of, of deep learning now perhaps, and that we will see things tail off again for a while. 
um, before it re-emerges. Sometimes that takes a different form. Sometimes it's just a jump in, in hardware that means that um, things can pick up again. So the reason that deep learning is took off again in 2012 was not just that the research was, was kind of coming to fruition, but it was because we suddenly had huge amounts of data mm -hmm. that this could run on and we had the power that could- From, from the search engines content. and things like that or? Yeah, yeah, and user generated content. So the, the first major deep learning paper that really broke things with unsupervised learning was because they took pictures of cats from YouTube and trained these neural nets on pictures of cats. And, and, and you know, deep learning happened. And just like, this had not been done before and it took millions of images. But before that, there really wasn't millions of images to train things on. Right, so right. It's these leaps forward that come from the weirdest of places. Um, Do you think also hold us up. there's always a, a, you know, well, we'll never make a robot that's conscious and even if we do, we'll never know and all that. But sometimes I wonder, is that possibly because there is no real consciousness? I mean, even us, there's, there, well, no, I don't mean to be, I'm not, yeah, I'm just saying <laughs> well, this that, is fascinating. well, I'm just, I'm just saying that it's, it's like, you know, there is that thought that it's like consciousness isn't really a real thing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a perception of our biology and all these neurons and even in our bacteria and our gut. And maybe that's why it's so hard to replicate because it doesn't really exist as a thing. And so maybe that, you know what I'm saying? It's like, maybe we will so get to not, a point with a robot that it's like, it's more than good enough because it's as good as yeah. you and I are in terms of right, that so awareness. This is getting right, you know, right into kind of the, the philosophers of AI and, you know, and, and David Chalmers work on the hard problem of consciousness. And it, this is, this is a huge thing. And, you know, the, like consciousness is, is such a weird thing that we don't know how to define it. We don't know how to test for it, but we know roughly what it is. We know what we mean when we talk about it, um, but there's no test for consciousness. Um, and anyone who tells you the Turing test is a test for consciousness is, is doesn't know what they're talking about. Right. The Turing test is a test of deception. It just wants you to fool someone. Right. Um, so this idea, yeah, I mean, the, the AI community is very torn on that. So there are people who say that can never happen. We can never have a machine that can be conscious because to be conscious, you need to inhabit a body, you need to move in the world, you need to get the senses and perceptions and cognition directly from the world. And, and we don't have a good enough way of doing that. And there are, you know, that, that there are limits on the system. And there are other people who say it's only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of sit agnostic in the middle, you know, on the fence going, mm -hmm. um, but perhaps, I mean, again, like, uh, and um, uh, Murray Shanahan, who talks about this, says about, you know, the idea of alien consciousness you know, if we met something how would we know it was conscious uh, like an octopus we know they're really smart now right um but for years we had no idea how clever they were or you know animals just what degree of intelligence do they have because we're not measuring it by our standards well no you, so, you I, again I, I i was doing such a deep dive into researching all this i forget who said what but i think it was you talking about the number of neurons in a cat's brain yeah. versus in right. a human's brain. And it's staggeringly, I mean, what did you, we're like oh, in, in the trillions or? I have to look it up. Now. Yeah, it was a lot. But yeah, we're in the trillions. And then the cat was like, you know, a hundred thousand. I mean, it was nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, but so does that, you know, maybe it's got a, like, I have my dog over here. Maybe he's got a sense of consciousness, but maybe his, his my version of what that consciousness is would be almost like dream state to me. And that's fully away, awake to him or something. I mean, we just don't know, right? Exactly. We just can't tell. Yeah, I find, I find things with so neurons. Yeah, a round, a round worm has 302 neurons. A cat has 760 million neurons. Okay. And humans have 86 billion neurons. Right. I mean, goodness gracious. Yeah. So yeah. that has to make a difference somewhere. <laughs> One would hope. Yeah. One would hope. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, I just, okay, what about last, okay. You, I'm sure you've seen the Black Mirror episode where the woman brings her partner back to life and all that through a doll. And, and, and I know, you know, I, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get an interview with the CEO of, uh, I forget what the company's called, but it's, it's one of these guys that's, um, you know, collecting, you can pay them to collect all your social media data and all this stuff, and they'll do interviews wow. four times a year. And ultimately, when you die, they'll make a chat bot of you. So your family mm -hmm. can, like, talk to you and things like that. And I'm assuming, you know, these things are going to merge just like in that Black Mirror mm -hmm. episode, yeah. which is like, oh, here's, you know, my wife passed or I really was in a great marriage between 2048 and 2053. Can you just take the social media and all the data from my wife then and make me a bot of her in that era? Because it got really shitty after whatever. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I assume that's 
I mean, right there, th- th- when I say these things, Terrible. yeah, I mean, this is not, this is not, this is not so science fiction in the way that the Death Star is science fiction. No, this is, definitely not. If we went cryogenic sleep, if that actually worked and we woke up in 5,000 years, this would probably be if we wouldn't already be living in a computer, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I again, I, I find a lot of problems and I'm very skeptical of the idea that you can download your brain and everything. Sure. I, I'm so skeptical I, of that. I, of but course, I understand. The, yeah. <laughs> but with the um, with the thing about, you know, the, the kind of creating your partner from the social media posts, I don't see why that's problematic. There was, it's only, I think, last week or the week before that um, someone got kicked off the GPT-3 um thing because they were trying they were training it on their partner's social media and trying to replicate their dead partner why would so they kick them people, off why is what is uh, wrong with I said it was an ethic, open AI said it was an unethical use of it um an unethical use of their product so this is the thing so another thing problem here is the the kind of morals of companies are very interesting uh companies who will not necessarily treat their workers brilliantly uh, and right. not any particular company, but at right. the same time have huge bans in place on anything around sex or adult content. I, I think it uh, makes, I mean, it's total sense because it's all the same. It's all about money. They're, they're not doing it because they care. They're doing right. it because they worry about Fox News reporting that, oh, you brought your dead partner back to life. Yeah. You know, I think that's an amazing that. thing. I so you, you, has to have, you have to have seen it. I get so excited. You has to have seen it. Hey, how are you? It's like I'm talking to a fucking doctor, Jeffy. Come on, put the Alabama back in the bottle. But listen, um, there was a there was a uh, a just heartbreaking but wonderful video of a of a Japanese mother who had lost her baby or her toddler, and she had VR on and they recreated yeah. her and she got oh my god and she as a parent I know, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Yeah. I mean, yeah so I can see I can see ethical objections here because you know, does that hinder the grieving process? Is it something that will cause more pain in the long term? Um, if someone is fixated on this, maybe there's more healthy ways um, that would help people. But I can also see the really compelling idea of being able to do that and and stay close to someone that you've lost. Yeah. And you know, for me, that idea, yeah, of, especially a mother with a child. You know, I I know people who have lost children, and for them to be able to have you know small videos and pictures and photos to keep them in our memories, not 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 necessarily even to dwell on, but to know that they live on in some way, right. um, in a it, it captured in some way, and that's a very compelling thing. So I can completely understand that. Do we have some kind of duty to make sure that's done in a in a way that isn't exploited? I think is the thing. Um, how would it be? Ex- how would it be exploited? Well, I was going to say by a company. So what happens if some company comes along and goes, "Oh, we, if you pay us X amount of money, oh. we'll bring your, you know." So it's like you know that memory at the Grand Canyon. Not a problem, yeah, but that's a, that. that's fifty dollars extra. Oh fuck yeah, it. Yeah, why don't you upgrade to yeah. our advanced memories? That's yeah, fair. Exactly. That's so um, I do worry about things like that, and and you know, so I'd like to see um, studies done on this kind of thing. But 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 through like time, we've tried to hold on to bits of people that we've lost. Yes. Oh my god! So. This is the latest one, and actually, my, my TV broke. My television broke the other day. My television. What do you call broke. your television? I don't have a name for my television. Oh, I, like I see. It. So Babbage is is a... Babbage gets one because Babbage scurries around and has got a bit of autonomy. Gotcha. My okay. television, my television broke, and and I got that TV from my granny, my grandmother oh, when okay. she died. My I said my mom was clearing out her house, and I said I'll take the TV. I don't have one. And this so is the, the you were really close to her. She was in your book, I was really right? Close to her. She, yep. Yeah, yeah. I wrote about her. So I got this television, and so I've had this television maybe five years now, and it's finally broken. Okay. And I was like, right, well, you know, do I get another one? And I have a daughter who likes TV and a partner who also likes TV, and I occasionally watch it. So I was like, yeah, we'll get another one. Right. But part of me did not want to part with something. Sure. That was my grandmother's, and and that you know she spent a lot of time with, even though. It's just a TV, yeah. you know, and not yeah. even one that works anymore. But if I can be that attached to a piece of, you know, plastic and wires and glass, you know, to, to feel an attachment to something that belonged to someone else, and we do it with all sorts of objects, that's not even a significant object. It doesn't have the, the beauty of some kind of sentimental object you might expect. But part of me is now going, I can't let that go. And so if we can create and hang on to memories of people and we give so much data out into the world. Yeah. And if we can gather that up and and store it in a way that means we can revisit the people we've lost, that is incredibly powerful and compelling. So I agree. So I completely need for that. 
Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I hope more people come around to that because I, I mean, again, they, they ultimately will, they will have no choice. The compelling ideas win, the financial ideas win, and and no one's not going to say, fuck it. Here's X number of dollars. I I would like a chat bot of my, of my dead wife or my dead grandma. Come on. I, I I don't know if you spend much time in virtual reality. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time in there, but there, there's a, a program and all it is is it's uh, I forget what it's called, but it just lets you kind of be in very idyllic nature environments. And there's mm. there's one like a fall landscape. And my dad died like almost ten years ago now, but he loved the outdoors and he loved nature. And every time I go in there, I just have this fantasy of like I would love to just suddenly there's an upgrade and there's my dad. And he's virtual, Aww. he's digital, but I could hang out with him in the woods and shit. Yeah. I mean, I I would love. I just I don't understand why there's just not a. a a race towards this, you know, but it is what it is, you know. Um, what about chemistry? So sex robots, I mean, that's the thing. We talk a lot in the, uh, we, like I wrote the book with you. We talk a lot in the book about um, the, the the technical aspects and the physical aspects, but so much about what makes a relationship fun is, and again, I mean, you do talk about oxytocin and, uh, you know, mm. uh, 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 endorphins and all that. But so much about what makes a relationship fun is that chemistry that really has nothing to do with, oh, look, she's got this really interesting attachment that lets you feel this way sexually. <laughs> I mean, that's well beyond. I mean, that's beyond that. That's an impo- uh, you know, that's hard to even imagine. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could induce that in some ways, I guess, um, perhaps with pheromones, you could. Oh, wow. Um, so artificially induced chemistry. Maybe. Wow. Some pheromones, some signs. I'm never some... leaving the house. I'm waiting here. <laughs> this is the best day so ever. Much, you know. Okay. This, it's not beyond the power of imagination. I think that, um, but I think that so much of it is projected. And um, if you think, I mean, okay. So the, the, the example I like to use is, how immersed people get in in fanfic so yes. fanfic is huge it's so interesting you know and 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 i remember the delight when i discovered fanfic i'm like oh my god i can keep i can extend the universe what is the fanfic part. that you liked oh i don't know if I say. oh come on now come on you can't bring it <laughs> okay, up so, um oh, well I, I i have a fondness for for sherlock fan fiction i will say for which one sherlock oh the sherlock. moffat show okay yeah yeah yes Yes, I'm a big fan of Moriarty. Okay. Lovely guy. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but I just love that this world could be extended beyond the the, the bounds of of what was originally created for it. Right. And that people, oh, there's so many talented people. I mean, there's some terrible writers. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So talented people. The imagination is incredibly powerful, and people are so invested to the the fact that they are they are sort of self-policing the alternative universes and 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 these extend you know okay yeah so computer games films books whatever they have you know if you name it it's their kind of thing right um and and there's you know there are checks about um sort of compatibility and you know does it does it really fit does it read true even when it's in ima- it's completely imagined and i think if you can project that much through things like fanfic why is it so hard to think you could project those feelings onto an inanimate object so uh, you know that you have built or even a digital object that you have built because especially if it responds to you um so you can build the same kind of of huge narratives in your head around something that's meaningful to you absolutely interesting Okay, I'm going to jump around real quick i i know we've been on an hour are you good on time for a little bit more or you got to go yeah 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 okay so I got to now I'm just going to tell you, you know, I already told you about college, so they're all bets are off. But um, I ran across and I'm trying to remember how I ran across it. It was stre- not not that I mean, I guess I would be ashamed of this, but I was not searching for it. I don't know. I, I might have been looking up stories about sex dolls for the stream we were doing. But regardless, I I got served up a video and it was a porn clip and it was a guy having sex with. I mean, this was so disturbing. I still can't get it out of my head. It was, it looked like a dead woman. Okay. So mm. it looked like it was necrophilia, whether it was a real dead woman, whether it was an actress playing a dead woman or whether it was a doll, I still don't know, but I clicked off immediately. Cause I, mm. uh, let's uh, hope it was a doll. <laughs> yeah. But the question is though, you know, I, you know, I have no problem going. Yes. If there was a, a real sex robot in a heartbeat, I would love that. But nothing I've seen so far is compelling to me to go, I want to spend the money or the time. 
But when yeah. you talk to these guys or girls, but mostly guys, it sounds like that, that have these dolls and that they are intimate with them. I, I struggle to imagine that, like, because it, it's got to be like being with a corpse, right? I mean, and, and I'm not even trying to be funny. I mean, it's like when you when you fantasize in your head and close your eyes about what does that connection look like? Right. You're just like in and out of this piece of plastic that's like, unk, 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 unk. I mean, what it's <laughs> right. I, I mean, think the, oh, no, I think I think the power of imagination is really powerful. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I don't think so. Um, and also bear in mind, these uh, these dolls take on the temperature of the environment that they're in. So okay. you can warm them as well. So they're okay. not necessarily cold. Um, so and there's the, I was going to say the skin. Of course, it's not skin. The the things are made out of the the um, silicone dolls. They ha, they are almost like um, human skin that's been that's had lotion on it. So it feel, it feels it feels like skin. Um, so it's easy to have that suspension of disbelief. Or I think it's you could suspend. Yeah, yeah. I think you could suspend disbelief. Um, and you know, if you think about sex toys, um, no one expects them to behave like a human, and people still get off with sex toys. So. Right. So, I mean, it's it's different because it's not the whole person. It's none of my but, business, but I have to ask because it's your area of. I mean, have you ever been with a sex doll? No, I haven't. Have you ever <laughs> felt compelled? I mean, for research purposes, I, genuinely, I'd be really, I'd be intrigued. I would be intrigued, definitely. Right. Um, but you know, I've, I've there's been there are some videos. There's a video online of someone who who a, a woman having sex. Oh, not, not not the video of her having sex, but right. describing what it's like. Um, to have sex with, with, a, with a male sex doll. Okay. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of interesting to, to hear about. Um, so, you know, I think the, yeah, I reckon that our imaginations are incredibly powerful and um, I'm fairly sure that there, you know, there, there are occasional one night stands where you kind of wish it was a sex doll. <laughs> right. Have you, have you seen, you have to have seen virtual reality pornography, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, that, I thought I saw. That's staggeringly, transform I mean that may I mean that's insane that oh, feels I, like I you're it, there yeah it, it, I find it but I find it disappointing because I, I find it disappointing because virtual reality promised so many things and I was around for the first wave of VR me, and me that was too. awful I yeah. was sick all the time Dactyl nightmare <laughs> and all that shit yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're just turning green from the, the latency and then um so this yeah this wave of, of vr and everyone's going oh vr porn that is the future and then you realize that it, it, it's not the future it's just first person point of view yeah if it was really the future you could you know you'd have scenarios where you were underwater or flying or you know having sex with the dragon i don't know whatever right. you want. um but but we don't because the content is too expensive to create right. um right now so right. so what we're getting is is traditional porn served up from a first person point of view perspective Right. Um, which is cool because it's a different thing, it's, yeah. but it's not fulfilling the, the kind of aims of the technology more generally. I, I can see that for sure. I, I want to talk briefly about sex toys only because the opening of your book, I imagine, could be its own book. Because when you, I, I had never bothered to think about the origins of these things, right? It's and and, and the fact, I mean, even the, the two favorites, one is real and one was soul crushingly disappointingly not the real one is just like holy cow they you said they use breadsticks as dildos um yeah and um, it makes going to the breadsticks. olive garden very very different for me now um <laughs> which i don't know they have that in europe probably not they're like yeah, don't try it at home yeah but that was like that's pretty amazing back in the when was this like uh uh that was ancient greece so that's a couple of thousand years ago right that they're and also i just got so much from this great book and it was just like also, because, you know, I did a video game set in ancient Greece and it was like uh, Greek mythology and all that stuff. And, and I always like to take the piss out of real conservative people because it's just like, you know, my character is very, you know, uh, he's very macho and very traditional male and stuff in terms of sort of straight male and everything. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's going to be gay in the sequel. And I do it just to fuck with the homophobes and stuff. And. Um, and I felt bad. It doesn't matter. But, 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 but anyway, the point being is that a lot of people come and say, oh, well. Yeah, but ancient Greece, there was actually a real sort of acceptance of homosexual. But then when you got into the details of it, it's like, yeah, you could be gay. You could be or you could be you could be an older man with a younger man. Yeah. But you can't put your penis in. You can't have anal sex. Right. I mean, it's like it's like that. Me, yeah, you, they, don't, they they fried upon you being the receiver. Right. Of it. And there was a lot um, of like putting your dick 
peanut, whatever, between the yeah. thighs and stuff, yeah, and yeah. that was okay, but oral sex, if you received oral sex, you were a bad guy, I mean. Yeah, absolutely, because the the the, the, um, the importance of being an orator, of, of speaking in the mouth, that was seen as defiled if you were to be on the receiving end. Right. So it was very much a hierarchy power thing around sex there as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. So one of my really good friends that um, she and I used to share a flat, and um, she's a classicist who works on this stuff, and it was just, it's fascinating. So I was able to just get all these amazing insights um, and going off with these notes going, I did what? Yeah. <laughs> just, well, the one that I was really bummed about, because I thought it was a brilliant story was, and I'd never heard about it until I read your book. And when I started reading, I'm like, oh, and then the next paragraph, you just bring me crashing down where you're saying that the, the, the there's a sort of a, a, a myth that uh, I think it was Cleopatra invented the vibrator yeah. by putting bumblebees in a gourd. And I was like, that's so cool. And then you're like, yeah, but that didn't really happen. I'm like, oh, that would have been the best. What a great story. Was, I saw that service on the internet a few years ago. I was like, oh, I don't think that's right. Yeah, I, <laughs> you never know, right? Um, yeah, and then that lady that you debated with where she was insistent that the vibrator was invented to, quote, cure hysteria. And it's like, you yes. have all these sources where it's like, no, it's not. It really wasn't. And, yeah. and, and there's been, you know, there's a wonderful book um, that... Uh, that was all about that, about how, you know, that really debunked that whole thing. I'm just going to find out the, the name of it. So, um, but yeah, basically this, this whole idea that that's how that sprung up is, yeah, completely not true at all. So there right. were, there was electro, electromechanical vibrators um, in existence um, from late Victorian times, but they were used to basically pummel muscles that were kind of to give... Uh, right. to release stress in muscles. And, and the guy that came up with the idea said specifically, these are not, for, we don't even talk about the genitals. But of course, they were quickly co-opted to course, do that because they did course. it very efficiently. Um, but they were never, there's no evidence at all of it ever being used to cure hysteria, despite the film that was made about it, despite the stories, right, there's literally right. no evidence for it. And, and I'll, I won't look at cornflakes in the same way again either because of your book. That's um, right. That's right. Um, so I, I got to ask, I know we've touched on it a little bit, but I still don't think, I, I, I understand fully. So the, the sexist idea, the misogynistic idea, the patriarchal idea of these robots, is that more of a, yeah, we have that in our culture. And so that's a, that's a reflection of a problem in society, but that doesn't mean that making a man's version of a woman idealized is necessarily a sexist act, just like a woman could go into real dolls and say, I want a guy that has this or a woman, but what else is assume she's a, a straight woman. Uh, I like this about men. I want this about men. I don't want this. I mean, I know that a woman can't really be sexist in that way and that she's not in the power position, but you know what I'm saying in terms of it, it, it is, is assuming that we were not a misogynistic sexist, you know, culture would is there something inherently wrong with picking and choosing the design of your partner? I mean, don't we do that anyway? It's just more inefficient. I, I think we, yeah, I think we do to a degree. And if you go, yeah, like you said at the start, if you go on dating apps, you have preferences, and, right. and you know, it's it's not necessarily um, a terrible thing. You know, what what turns you on turns you on. I guess um, it would only be it would only be harmful if it harms someone, right? Um, or it or if it perpetuates the kind of misogyny and stuff. And I think the problem here is that we're already saturated with these really powerful messages, negative messages about body image, which means that this is, is right. kind of a problem right. in, in that way. Um, or if it led people to, so for example, if it led to further objectification of women where you know they were seen as being these very biddable um, things only there to serve one purpose, right? So if you kind of get into that real weird incel -y kind of view of women, if it exacerbated that, then yeah, we do not want that. Absolutely right. not. Um, so I think that, that because, yes, because of that social problem, it is a problem. Um, if the world were fair, maybe there wouldn't be a problem with it. Do you think it's a valid uh, assessment that the reason we're seeing kind of the low birth rate in Japan and we're kind of starting to see it trickle into America a little bit is because of, um, you know, I think in the book you mentioned it was a taku, but I mean, ultimately, you know, internet porn and cam girls and the ability to sort of get your rocks off exactly how you want, when you want, without the fuss and the muss 
do you think a is that an accurate reason why you think or part of it i know there's also the shame issue and the working and all that stuff in japan mm -hmm. but I, do you think ultimately this is going to lead to a lot less people on the planet because why would uh, you not choose something that's exactly what you want versus something that's 80 percent what you want and 20 percent i got to deal with the real life of, of, a, of a real person I don't think it's the driving force behind it at all. Uh, I think there are many, many more complicated reasons, a lot of economic ones, a lot of social ones. Um, I think that it may be a factor in some people, sometimes some attitudes towards relationships, perhaps, and expectations around relationships. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, is it a bad thing if our birth rate declines right. in the west probably not necessarily a bad thing but i don't think it's the cause of it um so you know i think there are there are many other factors this may be a, a, a tiny part of it but um no and, and, and i think fundamentally we are biologically hardwired to seek out other humans and i think that is kind of what kept, kept coming up you know that 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 people this very idea that people are aghast that you might have any form of relationship with technology tends to be driven by that thing of, you know, but, but, but we're meant to be with other humans. And I think that's a very hard thing to escape. Do you think that's hard because it's it's evolutionary and it's biological? Or do you think it's hard because it's a societal idea that's gatekeeping? I think a bit of both. I think a bit of both. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I was do think that, that Go ahead. Sorry, I, was just, I, do, I do think our kind of hormonal instincts are very, very strong um and and you know that's uh, we you know we're, we're basically animals with with kind of you know tech with with bones <laughs> right <laughs> right exactly that's true okay um what about um well i have to tell you one more thing in your book that fascinated me i mean what a book um the whole I, look i'm agnostic atheist depending on the day um I was raised Jewish for about seven years and then I was like, fuck this. I'm atheist. I'm agnostic. Right. So I, I think it's all silly for whatever that's worth. But that said, I always assumed that priests were celibate. I mean, this is amazing to me that priests were celibate because there was something like in the Bible from, you know, the iron age. And it's like, you know, Oh, I, it's stupid, but I get it. Tell the good people at home, Dr. Kate, why a priest can't have sex and then tell the good people at home why in the hell that when we have all this molestation and all these problems in the church, this is still accepted. I, I was yeah. fascinated to learn this from your book. Money, money. Um, so yeah, basically that um, in the early days of the Christian church, um, priests could have, uh, did have families and children um, and the, then the children would inherit um, and the church would lose out. So they brought in this idea um, that uh, primogeniture, I'm sorry, uh, when, yeah, where they, you couldn't inherit. And so priests were basically told, you can't do that anymore. We need, we need the money to come back to the church. But they and, didn't uh, say it that way though, right? They didn't say we need the money. No, no, they, didn't. they said it's much better if you're very celibate. Right. Be very holy, you know, offer your body up to God, all that sort of stuff. So right. yeah, the whole, this whole kind of concept of, was, was to avoid things being passed down to the eldest son. Um, so the church, and, so the church would get it. So the church would get it. Yeah. The church were controlling a lot of land, a lot of money at the time. And then of course, and so it becomes, a, it becomes a, a, a an order of the church um and then of course different branches of catholicism or so different branches of religious catholicism will kept the celibacy but uh, protestantism said no it's okay that our ministers can have families and so forth you know so they it went in different ways um but yeah essentially you know they it really boils down to the fact that the church was losing out so they wanted to control that better yeah the more i learn about humanity the more i want to be with robots because at least <laughs> i do feel like that sometimes yeah, yeah exactly yeah. okay um last couple questions i have then i'll look at the super chats um okay i had a conversation with my one one of my daughters i have a daughter who's 18 i have a son who's 16 and then my ex was over um and we were talking about um deep fakes and I said to them, I said, you know, do you think, cause I know, I know you talked a little bit about this and uh, I don't know if it was a paper or it was somewhere recently you were mentioning deep fakes, but do you think it is ethically, morally problematic that if you take a famous per or any person, but let's say it's a famous person 
and you don't share it with the internet, you don't share it with the world, but you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to basically use an app and I'm going to put this person's face on this porn actress and I'm going to get my rocks off to watching porn with a person who would never do porn. Right. Where, where, where does that become unacceptable to people, but having sex with your partner and fantasizing this, I'm asking for a friend about Taylor Swift. Um, where does that become okay? But suddenly doing it on a computer, if you're not, if you shared it, Mm. I would agree that would be a problem, but I don't know how I feel about the other part, but my, my kids and my ex were like, that's horrible. That you should never do that. I I was curious your take on that though. It's interesting, isn't it? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm mostly of the opinion that what people do in the privacy of their own home is up to them. It's not harming anyone else. So I guess here it has to be, what is the extent of the harm? And you know, if it's if it's completely isolated, there's no chance of being fine. Maybe that's not such a harmful thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, deepfakes are problematic because of the um, because of the fact that it's being done without permission in most cases, and and that it's you know it, that that is a is a really dangerous thing, especially when it gets out there and it's shared. It's really really problematic. And I think the potential for fakery of all other things, not just porn, but the fakery in politics and all sorts of things, and the kind of despite of this fight against disinformation deep fakes makes that so difficult um so i'm very very wary of them but yeah i mean like you say well I, I think it is that case it's what what is the harm to come out of that um and, and i don't know enough to kind of work that or I haven't really sat and thought about it long enough where to work that if no one knows does it really happen kind of thing i guess right yeah. right right okay makes sense i was just curious um you're research, I mean, your work is, it's mostly AI, right? It's wrong to say that everything you do is tailored around sexuality and exactly. technology, <laughs> right? It's, I mean, that, that's a tangent, but you're more anything and everything about AI, right? Would you say? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, technology more quite, quite broadly as well, but at the moment, the work I do tends to be around AI. So I was working for several years on, um, sex and tech. Um, I'm also working right now on things on autonomy, uh, so autonomous systems so things like self-driving cars and, uh, mental health chatbots and things like that. We're also looking at, um, but yeah. And, and I teach, um, my students about, uh, AI and society and the impact that it has. Um, in terms of these things like <clears throat> legal implications, ethical implications, social uh, knock-on effects. Um, but I also teach uh, user-centered design. So how do we put people at the heart of the technology we create? Um, right. What is it, uh, the, how do people interact with technology and what are their expectations of it? Is, is, so there, kind of is there a new obsession or a new book or a new thing that you're mm-hmm. hoping to sort of really dig into? I am kind of, I say I'm writing a book. If the, if the publishers hear this, I'm definitely, definitely in the right. middle of writing it. It's, yeah. um, it's definitely going really well. Uh, yeah, I'm writing a short book um, on AI and sex, which is more broadly looking at all aspects of sex. So, you know, how is AI affecting things like the porn industry? How is it affecting things like okay. tackling sex trafficking? Um, can it be used for sexual health purposes? So it's kind of bringing those strands together. So it's gonna just be a short guide um, and hopefully we'll be out next year. Um, was this a success? It. Was this a success? Uh, for yeah, you? it was a success. So um, um, no one gets rich from writing books these days. Yeah, I know. Famous. So unfortunately right. I did not get mega rich. Right. Um, but um, it was a success in that, you know, it, it went on a second print run in its first week. And there's so paperback. Was, I mean, the fact there's paperback probably means it was. Yeah, I have, I have one, one of each. Oh, so, right. There you go. Excellent. Okay. Well, congrats. Rich. It's a great, it's a great book. Um, Thank you. I, okay. I have one more question and well, Okay, your comfortability talking about this stuff um, is is it's obviously refreshing. It's also rare, but you know what comes first for you? Were you always that kind of person, or was it that this got you more comfortable, and now you are this kind of person? Because it seems that you're very open about a lot of this stuff, and mm-hmm. I'm wondering what 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 drove what. I certainly wasn't like that as a kid, so okay. I think it's definitely uh, probably within the past, I I, uh, I don't know, maybe fifteen years or so that I started being more and more interested in in that kind of thing. I think when I started uh, working on this, and I was, you know, I, not that I was finding it difficult to talk about, but um, I've become blasé in the fact that I will now 
I forget that not everyone works in this sphere. And right, I right. Something and go, oh, wait, no, that's not considered polite. Um, so I think I, I, I've got, a, but I've got, I've now, since working in this area, the past sort of five years or so, I've also got a lot of friends who work there too now. So there was a group of us in, in London, um, sort of women working in sex tech, and we used to meet up for dinner and oh, you know, very cool. hang out and stuff. And it was really nice to know there are other, other people working in that sphere too. So I've got friends who are sex educators or sexual therapists or writers, people who write about sex. Um, and that's been really, I've learned a lot from that. So it's been really good for me because um, I see the way they phrase things. And you know, there's some wonderful journalists out there who write about this stuff really carefully and compellingly. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. So for every terrible story in the Sun newspaper or the right. National Enquirer, right, right, right. you've got a really considered article saying, Hey, you know, this is the actual truth of it. And, well, and you do deal true. a lot with um, the, and, and again, this woman you you did the debate with was insane where you were talking about therapeutic robots. Um, yeah. And it, it's just so, I mean, it's, you know, my, my mother-in-law uh, died recently of dementia and it's like, you know, I saw some of the stuff after I read about, heard about it and read about it from you, like uh, the seal that they, they Carol, it, yeah, it's a little, little robot, robot seal and yeah. you, you look at the videos online and these old, really old people are just smitten with it and it's, yeah. it's bringing a little bit of joy into their life and to sort of, exactly you know, sex stuff aside to deny yeah. the, the value of this stuff is, uh, which, which leads me to my final question. Then I will get to these super chats is you mentioned incels. Um, and that kind of comes up relatively often in this world. Um, it, it, you know, I, I would, I mean, I don't know. I certainly not in like the DSM five or four or whatever, but I would assume that most psychiatrists or psychologists would look at an incel and say, there's a, there's a mental deficiency here, uh, whether it's physiological or not this is a real problem that probably could, could be healed or should be healed or should be solved. I wonder, just like we talked about pedophilia, I mean, could, could a robot help with that, you know, or a doll help with that, or would it just make it worse? So I, I, I wondered about this and I did a dive into incel forums a while back. Oh Lord, um, oh Lord. Did you do it as you or you were a care you were like a dude? I stayed quiet. It was all the only the public facing ones. I didn't even go into private forums, okay. right? So I wasn't even gonna go there because um pluh, no. Right. Um and you know, it's it's really difficult. I don't the so I, I was I wanted specifically to read up on views on sex robots and there were a lot of people going, if you had the perfect programmable robot who was life like a woman in every way then that would be okay. And then there were loads of other people going, no, that's just another cope. It's just another, um, it's not good enough because it's not the women themselves who are being perfectly programmed, right? So it was, wasn't seen as being enough of a, a enough of a victory over women. Um, uh, so I, I just don't think you can engineer your way out of that kind right. of mindset. Okay. Um, it's, you know, because I think if someone is that determined that they, hate women and hate men who who are with women that much then saying here is a proxy for women is not going to make them happy right there's something else going on it's not a little right. Right. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right i'm going to read some super chats if you do want to talk live with good sir good sir i usually interview men um good ma'am dr kate she is here for you uh she will help you with all your maladies and all your issues uh Indeed. she's not just a computer science doctor but if you're like, have a weird itch, you'll look at that, whatever you need. <laughs> I'm uh, definitely a computer science doctor. Okay. No weird itches. Oh, right. Lord. Okay. <laughs> this is from Brian East. Thank you, buddy. He says, question for Dr. Devlin. We've discussed that the Turing test isn't a good indicator since it's based on deception. Is there an alternate test or alternative test that is, is valid or more valuable? I mean, not really that I know of. Um, so the Turing test was to, deter you know, you have to determine if it, you, if the judge has to determine if they're talking to a human or a machine. And um, so if you get a good enough chatbot, it could fool you, but it could fool the judge, but it's not doing it, it's not understanding anything. So I think that there, there's, not really a, there's not really a test yet in place to do that. But we, of course, we test AIs in different domains. So um, AI is very narrow in that it, it applies to specific domains. So you have an AI that can play Go, it can play Go better than a human. You have an AI that can play chess better than a human. So on those kind of tests, we're testing its intelligence, but for consciousness itself, nothing yet right okay um we might never have we might never know how to test that or even what right if, if, right exactly um grave doll says uh ai 
I don't know what ML, AI slash ML data sets. Machine learning. Oh, okay. Tend to have a bias issue. How could you balance ethics and countering bias to build AI for these app appliances, especially with lack of females in artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's a really big problem. And I think one, one of the really good things the past couple of years is that we've seen what a major problem bias is in the systems. And that bias isn't just in the algorithm. That bias is coming from the data, that it's the, the way the data is collected, the way the data is is even gathered in, yeah, in the first place. The bias comes in at every stage. and I don't think there's an easy way of solving that. I don't know that we'll properly do it, but I think the first stage is to be aware of it and to note to note it and to be very upfront about why this might be a problem. I mean, you could solve um, it through AI, right? I mean, you could have an AI recognize the bias and say- You could, but then that AI itself, who's training that AI- Well, that's probably it, true. Sorry. That's probably true. Yeah. It's AI all the way down. Um, but I think that in terms of women in AI, it's 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 the the gender gap in AI is even worse than computer science um, in general. So I think it's something like seventeen percent in computer science, and twelve percent in in AI. But one of the nice things about AI is that it's very multidisciplinary. So we are seeing input from other areas where women are more prevalent, um, including things um, like the the social sciences, for example. So that gives me a bit of hope. And I think that the the lack of women in computer science, oh my God, I've, I've just put up with so much shit over the years being a woman in tech. But you're you're the, saying you, you have? Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, I was like, I was doing my PhD in what, like 2000 to 2003, 2004. And I remember going to SIGGRAPH and they still had booth babes. They still had all the bikini clad women holding up the latest graphics card. It's like, really? It's, you know, it's a, it's a 21st century. Were you so, treated, but, I'm curious, because we hear this in games a lot, um, obviously. We're, oh we're, my God, don't t talk about ethics in games journalism. <laughs> we, we can, what do you mean though? No. <laughs> oh, don't, no. don't open the can of worms. I like worms. I'll go down that tunnel. Um, um, was I treat? Yes, I've, I've put up with some shit in my time from from people. What, do you, um, what, so. what is that? Like, what what do you? Th I mean, I, I, I got it. I mean, I know it's a big question. I don't want to, you know, you, I, it's taking so much of your time, but I, I'm just fascinated by this because it's like, I mean, no one wants to think they're the creep in the room. So I'd like to think and I've never heard anybody say that I've been offensive or problematic in that way. I don't think I have, certainly. But when I hear these stories, I just go, I don't. I can't put myself in the shoes of those men. I don't understand that. Like we, we had a, a wonderful artist who worked for us at one of our companies and she was saying she was a little late. We didn't care, but she was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm late. I'm like, I don't give a shit. And she's like, um, Oh, some guy tried to kiss me. I'm oh. like, and she's like, she was literally just walking from her car to the office. And, and I'm like, I, I don't understand. Like what, what, yeah. what do you think that is? Like, where does that come from? It's it's a socialization thing. It can only, I, you know, I, I I don't get otherwise. Where, and I think when you have so there's there's a really some really interesting studies on the kind of rise of the programmer and the kind of 1980s where personal computers beca because they became important. That's when that shift from women being involved in computing kind of they got pushed out a lot because it was suddenly seen as being more prestigious and there was a lot of men who were already controlling things at the top kind of taking over. And um, you get the rise then of, of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. And um, that, so uh, Joseph Weizenbaum wrote about this in, in, in the 80s, saying you know, this this sort of the, the computer bomb, right? This whole idea of this very male hacker culture. And I think that's still, there's a lot of that today. So when I was doing my PhD, there were maybe, maybe uh, four or five women in that department. And right. um, I used to get told all the time, oh, your work's fairly fluffy, it's not proper computer science. I was writing display algorithms for tone mapping and high dynamic range, and I was doing <laughs> doing perceptual. Was it in your comments? Perceptual. You were like, "Oh, I think this." I mean, how, what? How is your? This is people to my face. In the but how? Room. No, but how is code fluffy? Right, I don't know. So because it wasn't, no, it was seen as being a fluffy subject, a fluffy topic, because oh, it okay. wasn't like formal methods or cryptography or Got whatever it. it was. That was, you know, yeah. I wasn't, you know, up all night writing things in Haskell. I don't know whatever they were doing that right. they thought was better but i used to do that in computer vision the computer vision lots did not like the graphics lot there was that natural rivalry and they thought they were better ha okay. they've been replaced by machine learning right ha, yeah you. that's true there you <laughs> so, go <laughs> um so there's been a lot of a lot of that crap over the years but i think that you know um unfortunately that gender gap doesn't you know it's it's kind of stayed constant over the years but um 
I think we need the two-pronged approach. So we do need women in, in leadership positions. But look at the shit that women are getting in Silicon Valley that, you know, they might have women who've left, like, places like Microsoft, like Reddit, like, you know, whatever, you, you name it, or like Google. I mean, don't even start me on Google this year. But um, there's, there have been so many issues. So we need those well, women yeah. at the top, but they're getting treated badly too. Yeah, I don't track that as much as I track the games industry. And I, I mean, every couple of weeks, there's another story of one of these big companies where there's all kinds of things that uh, allegedly happen, which I assume are true. Um, I think California, I know California just filed a, a huge lawsuit against Activision uh, Blizzard for a bunch of really nasty stuff. Oof. So we will see. I Hopefully it'll yeah. get better. It better, better get better. So, okay, I got one call. Can you do one phone call? Yeah. All right, uh, you dropped out of the Discord though. We lost you. I did, let me try and get back in and okay. see what happens. Uh, Okay, my joint voice. <gasps> I'm in. Oh, there you go. Okay, so uh, Grave, you are on with Dr. Kate. Go. Hello. Hello. Oh gosh, I can't hear you, folks. Can you hear us now? Oh no. Can you hear us, Grave? How about, How about now? No, he can't hear either one of us. Uh, we can't hear you, man, or you can't hear us. We can hear you fine, though. Uh, there's, in the meantime, I'll read you another question that just came in for you. We'll see if he gets his stuff fixed. Can you ask Dr. Kate about the possibility of writing a book about combat AI and or robot? She hinted at it in her turned on when she mentioned drones. Ooh. Okay. I can't so, hear you. I can't hear no, you guys yet. talking about this. But um, my, my friends. Um, um, oh, hang on. I, I got you. Go ahead. Okay, so I keep answering the one that. Yeah, I'm, I, I, okay. Grave, I'm, 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 I'm muted, I'm muted you for a second, Grave. We'll get okay. back to you. Okay. Okay. So yeah, um, so Julie Carpenter, who's um, a wonderful researcher in AI and and studying under interactions with humans, she's written a book about um, military robots and bomb disposal robots and the relationships between them and the people who operate them. And it's absolutely fascinating. She's, she's done it from an anthropological perspective and she talks about the bonds that they form and how they name these machines after, you know, after their wives, after their, their sisters and their mothers and Hollywood stars, um, and how they even hold funerals when these bomb disposal robots are, are damaged mm. or put out of service. And it's, it's really fascinating. But, um, yeah, so for, for things on AI and drones and drone warfare, there's lots of work out there. Um, by and large, the AI community is very worried about autonomous weapons with kill, making kill decisions because we know how flawed the system are. I've met some people who are in favor of it, but most people I know like... Um, They're more in favor of a drone being autonomous than a guy sitting in Vegas controlling it. Why would they, yes. want, why would they want that? They're, no, they're more, yeah, why would the, the people who want autonomous? Well, yeah, why would you want it to be AI when you can have somebody still out of harm's way taking care of it? So the, the reason why some people think it's, it's better is that there's less chance of human collateral. There's more chance of, um, of getting the target correct. I see, I see. making those decisions. So they feel like an automated way is better and quicker and can do a better evaluation. A lot of the people um in the ai community feel that that's not possible due to bias in the system and due to problems with the ai and that we're not at that stage so there's a and, and the, that the technology will be massively misused in the wrong hands um so there's a lot of fight to keep that really well controlled have they done studies on the sort of ptsd and stuff of the drone pilots like i'm fascinated by the fact that these guys you know are bombing people across the world and then they go home for lunch with their family and, and take a walk and go back to work and do it again. I mean, I think, that has yeah. to fuck with you. I think so. There's a lot, I think there's a lot of study has been done on that. I don't, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the literature there, but I would imagine there's a, a huge amount of work going on there. Yeah. Got it. All right. Let's try grave one more time. If not, we'll wrap it up. Uh, okay. all right. You folks now, I'm grave. sorry about that earlier. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. All right. Uh, so we are going to, I'm going to mute myself in zoom. Um, and now I'm only on uh, the uh, Discord, and let's see if Dr. Kate's on. I'm on. Okay, what's up, Grave? You're on with the Hi, doctor. Kate. Thank you so much. I just wanted to dive a deep, uh, a bit deeper into the creation AI within sexuality as a whole, because it's not in chemicals kind of going off 
a mix of all of these different things at once problem to solve and we're seeing through the reality of driving cars is super super difficult mm-hmm. um so i mean right how how far out are we away from this to seamless experience for individuals who are interested in this Ooh, Ooh, a seamless, seamless experience, experience um, um i think is still quite far off, off. um i don't, I don't know, know that, that I mean, I mean, with things, things like, like self-driving cars. Oh, hang on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you need to mute yourself in the Zoom. You're echoing. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. I'm echoing on this. No worries. Yeah, I think, I think with, um, with things like self-driving cars, we seem to be making some progress, but mm-hmm. um, it's the integration of those into a world that has humans behind the wheels of cars that becomes problematic. So it's that where the two meet is really difficult um, because they've got to factor in other humans. Um, mm-hmm. I think there are, with the idea of seamless integration with AI in general, um, some of it's already there, some of it in the apps that we use, but when it comes to conversations with AI, probably we could be another 10, 20 years before we see it move into something more seamless. Yeah, with natural language processing. Yeah. And so one one kind of follow-up to the UK, I assume, and I hate to assume, um, but have you, Philip, who is a UK advertising consultant? I, I think we lost your sentence. What did you? Lost mine, can yeah. you do it again, Grave? About the UK. Of of, of course. Um, have you ever crossed paths with Cindy Gallup, who's called Not Porn, aimed at? kind of rejigging yes. the industry in a way. Just your thoughts on her. She's a, an absolute bat. Talk to her before. Please uh, please check her out yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, um, so Cindy Gallup's company is, is real. I think Cindy's amazing. She's doing really good work um, trying to disrupt things um, and make more ethical and, and um, better porn. And, and I think that... Well, can you say what she, time... what she does? Because we, we couldn't hear him all that okay, well. So... Okay, so Cindy Gallup is um, she's an entrepreneur. Um, she's currently U.S. based, I think, and she has a company called Make Love Not Porn, and it's a an ethical porn company where uh, people just real life can post um, videos of sex and get paid. People pay per view to watch them, and um, it's it's done on a, on a very open and fair basis. Um, so it's not exploitative. And the idea is to disrupt the porn model um, that we see with, with uh, MindGeek and Pornhub and to try and make it uh, fairer and, and less discriminatory and less exploitative. Got I it. think it's, really, it's a really good idea because every time I do a debate with someone who's, who has an issue with porn, they always say that's because everyone is exploited. And I'm like, yeah, there is terrible exploitation in porn, but surely there's a better way we can do that. And, and Cindy is one of the people working towards that. All right, great. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Um, I have one more quick call, if you don't mind, but I have to ask you a fast question. Yeah. Is that okay? So what about that? Like, the I, is it possible? Because this is a debate that I, I, it's never gone away since we started discussing it in high school. Um, is it possible to be a sex worker and genuinely enjoy that work and say, I'm in it because I want to be in it and I make a good living and assuming they're not exploited or is it like the very nature of that? Cause society will tell you the very nature of doing that work means you're broken or you're damaged or you don't really want to do that work, but you have to, is that, mm-hmm. is that your experience in terms of talking to a lot of these folks and sex, sex uh, uh, educators and whatnot? Or so um, there are, I mean, there there are degrees of sex work. Um, there are, you know, there there are people who who work uh, who have who have sex with other people. There are people who do webcam stuff. There are people who perhaps do I don't know sugar daddy sites or stripping, whatever. Um, so these these are different degrees, um, and you know, some people say they're very happy to do that. They're very open about it, and that you know the work is is fine for them. But they see it as a job. Um, so I know that there, there are other people who are forced into this, who don't have that choice because the choice is between not eating and, and, you know, or, right, or right. You know, they have to do it because they need the money. So I think there are definitely degrees. I think if you're interested in that, there's a, a new book has just come out. Certainly it's just out in the UK. It's by um, an academic called Kate Lister. And she writes basically a history of sex work. Oh, and she's, okay. she's, she's 
very she's smart and she's funny and she's very honest about this kind of thing. She's also got a book called The Curious History of Sex. What is the name of the, what's the name year. of the first book? The one the the one that's just out is called um I sh- let me think it's called something I will hang on I will look it up because okay. it, it it's about um it's literally just come out like in the past couple of weeks um right harlots whores and hackabouts a history of sex for sale okay keep going sorry so um yeah harlots whores and hackabouts by kate lister okay. and that explores um the people it's sort of through the the sex trade through the eyes of sex workers gotcha. um so that's really she's really good she's really well informed um and yeah if you want to hear more about that she's okay. the person to kind of look to all right final call final question this is from kaiden kaiden uh you were talking to dr kate devlin hi dr devlin um hi i wanted to ask if you are familiar with the anime films the japanese animated films of ghost in the shell so I've I don't know I mean I I've heard of them I've never seen them so I, I'm kind of uneducated in that aspect I guess. <laughs> well, there's too much to to talk about when trying to describe them. I was just thinking of uh, one film in particular, the uh, second film ever made in that franchise, which has to do with the theme of sex dolls, in which ah. they were illegally um, produced in a way that they kidnapped young girls and were essentially copy pasting their consciousnesses on, oh, wow. on the sex dolls in order to try and make them more desirable as in giving them a sort of fake sentience that make them act more like real people however in mm-hmm. the story the consequence was that they went psychotic and started killing their masters so what i wanted to ask is if um such a thing is possible in trying to copy the consciousness of a person into an AI or into a robot with a computer brain and maybe the person can essentially achieve some sort of immortality, if not the person themselves, then at least a facsimile of their conscience. Is there yeah, any think, um, path in that regard right I now? Think the whole, the, I think, yeah, the idea of the facsimile of consciousness is definitely, uh, I think, something that people see as plausible. Again, coming back to the idea of taking all that user-generated content that we put online in our social media and using that as a basis rather than as a direct consciousness link. So I think that, you know, if we consider ourselves to be, in, a, in essence, a sum of everything we create o- online, then perhaps we can take all that digital information and, and create a version of ourselves. Um, so there's that route to it, I would say. Um, but that's really interesting. And, and I, I just, the, this bit where you mentioned that they kind of rise up and kill the masters, is a kind of a trope that we see in a lot of films with fembots. And it's almost like it's this warning thing about, you know, don't let those women get out of place or, you know, because they might rise up and attack. And, and I, I find it so fascinating. We see that again and again with things like Ex Machina um, and films like that. That Yeah, so it's really interesting. I'm go- I will make sure to watch that, actually, because it sounds really relevant. Thank you. All right. Thank you for answering my question. I was also just hoping... Jaffe, let's have that movie for a watch party. Soon. Yeah, well, well, I would. Lo- I love the first one. I've never seen the second one, so we'll put it on uh, the next watch party. Thank you very All right, much. Thanks, man. Um, um, wait, it was important. Um, um, Ex Machina, great movie. Yes. Um, at the end, uh, you can get out. You can. You don't need that anymore. I'm back on here. Yeah. Back. <laughs> Oops. Or am I back? I can't hear you you're, now. You're back. I'm not. Oh, yeah. I can hear you now. So at the end of that movie, I, this, this is just nothing to do with your work. I'm just curious because I know you wrote a little bit about it. Um, what is that? Why does it? I, I was just like, why does she look at him at the end? You know what I'm talking about? When she gets in the elevator and she looks at, I forget the guy's name, who's locked in the room. Like, it seems like she wouldn't care. But is the look of, what do you think the look is for? What is that oh. about? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Is she supposed to have emotions or is she still supposed to be as cold? Are we supposed to think that maybe she has some? That's what I'm wondering if that's what you got from it. Like maybe. Yeah. Or is it just a, you know, an impassive thing? It's so interesting. I love that film on so many levels. And yet at the same time, I remember someone 
Ar someone who was a consultant on the film argued with me that it was a feminist film, and I was like, "Dude, it's not a feminist film. <laughs> she has to use her sexual party." Because yes, she. Oh that right, that's so right. We were kind of having this discussion over it, um, but I think it's it's so interesting, um, especially the bit at the end where he tries to use the card and it says "rejected." You know, it's like, right, oh, right, you're totally rejected by everything, including it, this woman. It, 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 yeah, it is. It is weird about it because I mean, you know, you can go down a rabbit hole with it, but it's like. It may not be a feminist film, but it certainly is an anti-masculine um, film in terms of the very nature of mm. them. They they both died at the end because yeah. they were <laughs> they were trying to outdo each other. The fact where he's like, "You yeah. dumb son of a bitch! You totally killed us both because yeah. you thought you were smarter than me." It's like I mean, it, you know, there's that that bro pro, bro pro, programmer it's stuff. Definitely a programmer about. kind of yeah. anti-programmer thing, which you know. Is great for me. I don't, and I like then the very next movie he makes, though, is all super... Pro I don't know if you saw Annihilation, mm. which is all... I haven't watched it, but uh, I heard, yeah. It's crazy. Okay. Um, I love it, though. It's so beautifully shot as well. It's, it's, just, it's, it's a wonderful... Movie. And I know you went there, right? Which is crazy. I went there. You went I there. went to the... So the, it was filmed at the um, the Jouvet Landscape Hotel in Norway. Is the and actual a, house the hotel? The hotel, yeah. So the exterior, the exterior bits, yeah. Right. Um, so it is this amazing glass building on the edge of this river with the big rock in it. And, and you know, it, it, oh my God, it's gorgeous. And um, I got invited to go on an AI retreat there. Where oh my away. God. Was, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So there were about, I don't know, maybe 20 of us who were all working in various different aspects. A lot of designers, people doing user centric design and, and people in AI ethics and all sorts. And we, we went there for four or five days and walked up some. Norwegian mountains and nice. swam in the river and yeah, it was just a really right. cool time. It very, very cool. Your book was great. Uh, I can't wait for the next one. So I really recommend it. You guys turned on is awesome. It's been out for a while. It's, you know, I don't, I, it's easy to find. And if it for is. no other reason, you should read it for this. I'm going to leave you with this. This is, this should have gotten you an award. This is on page 77. It's and, 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 and it's a footnote. Page 77 says, um, it's talking about the government researching ESP. Um, and it says that um, Turing argued that a tele telepathy proof room would satisfy all requirements. And the footnote says, or as we know it, a room. <laughs> Which, you know, given given the fact that Norm MacDonald just died this week, I think he would appreciate that, oh, that, that joke. That's, so that's, that's pretty great. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so, so much for you doing this. Um, and I hope you had a nice time. And I, I did. Thank good. you. That was I, really fun. I hope to talk to you later. And Babbage, goodbye, buddy. Don't kill us. I appreciate it. He's doing well. Good. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Stay on chat. Thank I'll talk you. to you in a minute. Bye, everybody. Okay. All right. There goes Dr. Kate into the sunset. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat. Um, what are you looking at? I don't even know what you're looking at right now. You're probably looking at my messy computer screen. Uh, let me get you. Let me get you something prettier to look at real fast. Um, hang on. Uh, okay, one second. One second. All right. Well, there's that. That's a great one. It's not the can. I don't know where the can went, fellas. Um, uh, listen, I appreciate you hanging out with us, talking to Dr. Kate. Um, obviously, this will be up on the video if you want to watch it later. Um, in the meantime. I will be back. I will be streaming a game today. I think I might be streaming a new game called Game Deck. Uh, I'm not sure if it's my kind of game or if it's a good streaming game, uh, even though it might be a great game. I haven't played it yet. I still I have codes to give away for that. Um, I will be streaming. Um, uh, I, I, I will be doing a death loop video. So there'll, there'll be game stuff and then I'll do a Gabin and games this week. In the meantime, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the calls. Thank you, Dr. Kate. Thank you for the super chat.